Thank you so much for coming. Um, this is quite a turnout and I really appreciate everyone being here um, and, and particularly uh, the students, uh, the organizing committee, Kimberly, who, who generously brought me here uh, today. Um, so thank you all. I, I do want to note before I get started, I'm going to be talking about, and then we're going to be talking about difficult subjects. Uh, difficult subjects that get at the heart of questions of race, gender, homophobia on college campuses. So I want us to think about not only those discussions and not only the issues from race theme parties, rape culture, but also how we as individuals come into those conversations. Because we, we don't all come equally. We come from our own experiences, from our own social locations, our own identities. And so when we talk about rape culture, when we talk about blackface, we have to reflect on those privileges and what it means, what our relationship to that history is and how our own identity shaped that. So just, just wanted to uh, contextualize my comments today. Um, so I'll do a little bit of reading, a little bit of talking, um, and, and then we'll have a discussion. So uh, I, I wanted, I mean, you can see with these two quotes, uh, I wanted to talk about parties uh, and the issues of racism and sexism and misogyny and white supremacy as it relates to party culture, but not do it in a way that isolates, uh, not do it in a way that treats Saturday night as something apart from the campus, from the culture. So often, that actually is the defense. You'll have college presidents and others say, well, that happened on Saturday night. That happened off campus. That happened at someone's house distancing themselves, the campus, the history, and the culture, and therefore accountability. So I wanted to have that conversation and also connect to uh, the broader themes about tourism. Um, and so when thinking about tourism, I, I want us to, to think about the way in which tourism not only allows one to travel, uh, literally, metaphorically, symbolically, but also the way that power and privilege is embedded in those experiences. And as this quote from Bell Hooks points to, the way in which race, when framed as spice, when framed as the exotic, plays into that touristic experience. So to understand party culture and the ways that racism and sexism are central to party culture, we need to understand the shared ways that today's colleges and universities resemble tourist destinations. What we might call the club medification of colleges and universities. Here are just a few examples of different campuses across the country um, that look like theme parks, malls, uh, and, and fun places. Um, I, I didn't have to get pictures from those campuses that looked at their classrooms to show you the disparity between where and what colleges and universities are investing. So in many ways, they, like the tourist industry, are selling an experience. They're selling what two scholars have termed paying for the party. That yes, you may walk out the door with piles of student debt, Sorry for that reminder. 
you may walk out, yeah, this is the, you may walk out with uncertainty about job future, but you're gonna have fun. And you can imagine not only is this part of what is being sold, but how that replicates inequality in itself. That those who have safety nets, those who have a job because of who they know, they can pay for the party and they're gonna come out all right. But those who's, who've been taught over and over again that the American dream is at the end. It's, that party is not gonna be worth the same. But there are other ways that we can see the kind of shared logic and ideology between the tourist industry and today's colleges and universities. How often have we heard someone say, Oh, I'm getting ready to graduate and enter back into the real world. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. These are the same sort of narratives, the same sort of ideas that this is not the real world. And I want us to think about in, in both cases, whose experiences does that erase? When people talk about going to Hawaii as wonderful, as paradise, are they talking about the experiences of those who work in those hotels? Are they looking at and thinking about rates of poverty? When they talk about colleges and universities not being the real world, are they thinking about those who are working in these spaces? who are laboring, whether we're talking about in the classroom, adjuncts working on for poverty wages, or those working in other parts of the university. When people say it's not the real world, what does that mean when our discussions move to talk about racism on campus? sexism on campus. If it's not the real world, if it's a bubble, that creates this idea, well, it's different. Along these same lines, because colleges and universities, like the tourist industry, are selling the party, they're doing so with the belief that that party comes at no cost. No cost to those who experience is hurt by the party. That the focus on pleasure of fun, freedom, given primacy at whose expense? So we can think about the way that both of these spaces privilege white, male, cisgender, heterosexual pleasure. We can think about the way that both these tourist destinations and these collegiate destinations appropriate other cultures as spice. The other is seen but not heard. We can see how diversity is come to represent it in a brochure but not in the daily practices, not integrated in to the social organization of those spaces. We see how both these tourist industries and colleges and universities privilege commodities, profits over people, the importance of fun, spectacle, the party, the sporting event, the mass experience. And you can think specifically how, it's, 
We're right at spring break. Spring break and tourist destinations are selling very much the same thing that colleges and universities are. Alcohol, drug culture, sexualized images of women, the party. Another way that we can see the shared logic is the way that policing and surveillance operates in these spaces. So when we think about the ways that the war on drugs is and isn't carried out on college campuses, and the ways that drug culture gets normalized and part of the tourist experience, of who gets policed, who experiences the effects of a growing police state. So these are all different ways that I want us to think about the, the shared uh, logic, the shared ways that tourism and colleges and universities operate. And I want us to really reflect on what does it mean that places of learning, places of social and individual transformation are increasingly resembling Club Med. And not just in terms of where the money is being invested, but how they're being run. It is not surprising that a recent study found that 84% of college uh, presidents, university presidents, said race relations on our campus is great. 84%. When I first started at, at Washington State University, uh, there were several incidences of homophobic graffiti on campus. And when the president was challenged by students in terms of campus climate, he said, I feel safe. <laughs> Never mind that he was a white male I like that. <laughs> Felt like a punch, like a, an exclamation point. <laughs> Not only was he a white heterosexual male, but he was the president of the university. And it didn't even like, hey, I'm glad you feel safe. It's not surprising that when these incidents, incidents, just the language that we use, that it's apart, that it's abnormal. See? That it's not part and parcel of the culture. That language itself is revealing. And in part, that language is necessary because what is being sold requires an acceptance of these cultures. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about them not as incidences, not as specific to Saturday night, not just fun not just a joke, but endemic and reflective of not only specific cultures from specific universities, but university culture, college as a whole. I want us to think about both those locations, those specific colleges, as interconnected, to think about the ecosystem what Stacey Patton refers to as the racial ecosystem. That what happens on Wednesday night, what happens on Thursday in the classroom is connected to what happens on Saturday night. What happens in the admissions room affects what happens on Saturday night and vice versa.
So these are some of the questions that I want us to kind of grapple with as, as we're going. You know, when people say that these parties that we'll talk about in a second are just fun, for whom? At what cost? Whose pleasure, whose fun matters? Even when people say, well, this is a learning experience. This is a teachable moment. A teachable moment. Who has to be the object of that lesson? Who gets to learn? Who gets to experience, to make mistakes? Who gets to live? Even when we talk about the responses from students, from students of color across the country, what does it mean that we have accepted a culture where students who came to a college, who are paying for a college, are expected to transform the culture. An unpaid full-time job. <laughs> and not a shared responsibility. And we can think about the same expectations the faculty of color have. Whose responsibility? So, although not a new phenomenon, it seems that over the last several years, we've seen a proliferation of, quote, ghetto, gangster, south of the border, taco and tequila, cowboy and Indian, parties. Parties at more than several dozen colleges and universities have received national uh, coverage in the past couple years, with countless others going unnoticed, save for the pictures posted on sundry websites. So I, I want us to remember that the vast majority of these parties are never seen nationally, but they are known and they affect those campuses. It is tempting to look at such events as cliched racist expressions. They are, after all, contempt contemporary minstrel theaters that allow middle and upper class white Americans to cross moral and social boundaries by racial cross-dressing. They get to be racist, they get to push the boundaries. And while these explanations fit, they keep us from looking at the circumstances on college campuses that make these parties pleasing and powerful for many. In many respects, race-themed parties represent what Lisa Nakamura, tomorrow's speaker, and others call identity tourism. They're the culmination of a conservative and reactionary politics on college campuses that have been building up for the last several decades. They reflect the ongoing on insecurities around whiteness, around masculinity, around heterosexuality, and wake of the civil rights movement, and the supposed prominence of multiculturalism and political correctness. Indeed, Touristic parties are part of a broader reactionary movement that believes whiteness and colleges and universities are being imperiled by the PC police, radical professors, feminism, ethnic studies, and identity politics. Pushing against these perceived evils, these party goers have, have organized consciously these events to reassert dominance. It's not a coincidence that the vast majority of these parties happen in which two months? Anyone 
have an idea of when the vac February and not not October, J January and February. The King holiday and Black History Month. Not a coincidence. Because even when we think like, like, oh, it must be around Halloween. October, it, every time I talk about this, people say October, September, when school is starting, vast majority. And we need to read these alongside of other events, whether it be affirmative action bake sales, white only scholarships, and these broader discussions about the attacks and the waning power of white masculinity. Uh, this isn't part of the talk, and I don't want you just think the 2016 election. Part of what is embedded in university culture that allows it to flourish, that allow these parties to flourish, is the logic that we see throughout society. That it's just a joke. And I want us to be clear that, it, that it's not just a joke. If it's just a joke, it's not a joke. The reason it's a joke is because social, political, historic meaning informs it. The reason we understand the joke is because of its context. So just as Leslie Pika and Joe Fagan have talked about front stage racism and backstage racism, the public is the front stage, the backstage is the private, the racially homogeneous, saying it's just a joke becomes a way to say, I'm about to say something that I'm rightly gonna get checked on. But I said it's just a joke. It has become part of the language, what Eduardo Benito Silva would talk about, the language of colorblind racism. It, but jokes are socially produced. <coughs> jokes hurt. Jokes provide pleasure at the expense of others. They normalize an ability to travel to a space where you can not only say offensive things without consequences, but can imagine a world that privileges and maintains dominant identities. As M.M. Manring notes, one way to look at a joke is commonly termed incongruity theory, an idea put forth as early as the 18th century by James Beatism, who wrote that, quote, laughter arises from the view of two or more inconsistent, uh, unsuitable, or incongruous parts of a circumstance as united in one complex object, end quote. A joke is just a joke, except that in respect, it reveals a common cultural knowledge. A good joke by its very nature collapses if it requires any such explanations. So the fact that these parties or these jokes exist, the fact that they're normalizing stereotypes, the fact that we have this language sanctions one to say these jokes. I wrote a piece over the summer with uh, collaborator Stacy Patton on Amy Schumer. <laughs> Hopefully I'm, I have never, uh, it was a, a, a critical piece. I have n we have never gotten so much hate mail in the, like, like, it's just a joke. Then why are you so mad? 
If it's just a joke, why are you so invested in telling those of us who are critically engaging that it's just a joke? If it's just a party, if it's just a costume, why aren't you walking down the middle of campus at 11 o'clock in that costume? Because despite saying it's just a joke, these jokes, these parties, are part of a culture of dehumanization that rationalizes and sanctions brutality. Those are just a few examples from, from different colleges and universities um, and I just wanted to note a, f a few dynamics that one, one, of, one of the most common types of parties is parties that render blackness in ways that Catherine Russell would say that makes blackness and criminality indistinguishable. And in a nation in a nation of racial profiling, in a nation of mass incarceration, in a nation where, well, let's not even do a nation. Just write up Seattle and King County, where 70 percent, according to Catherine Beckett, of those who sell Drugs, 70% are white. Yet 70% of those incarcerated for drug distribution are black. In a nation where when 95% of people are, are asked to imagine a drug user, they picture a black person, it ain't just a joke. It ain't just a party. It ain't just a costume. In a nation where Latinos are routinely denigrated and demonized as illegal, as undesirable, as stealing quote unquote jobs, as being on welfare. Those images matter. Those parties matter. It is in enacting the lies and misinformation and stereotypes and what Herman Fagan would call the sincere fictions. That anchor contemporary and historic understanding of, ra of race. Party at the top the racist rager. Beyond, there's two elements that I want to highlight. Beyond the way that the party becomes a way to perform racism. So therefore, the rest of the campus is colorblind, post-racial, all good. But we're going to have a party that's racist. Normalizing the rest of the campus, and in doing so, replicating 100-year-old tropes, stereotypes that imagine Asian as, as foreign, as antithetical to Americanness. <laughs> Lastly, one of the things you'll see in many of these images is the way that race and gender operate intersectionally the way that blackness and masculinity operate through a narrative of physicality, of sexuality, and the way that race operates intersectionally with femininity. 
the way that women of color imagine as exotic, hypersexual, or as having children. and being on welfare. So you can see the ways that hypersexuality of the exotic <coughs> is staged through grotesque stereotypes of women of color. furthering and normalizing racial otherness. So, before I get to that, what often happens in these conversations is we, we, we disconnect them. And part of having a conversation about the way in which parties and the way in which race-themed parties perpetuate a hypersexualization of women, perpetuate a culture that sees women as objects of consumption, that that needs to be talked about in relationship to rape culture and the way in which this culture, this value system, perpetuates and normalizes a culture that reduces women to objects of, of sexual consumption. We also see the, the shared language, the dehumanization, the blaming of victims. So I want us to think about how the failure of universities, not only the failure of universities to address rape culture and to address issues of sexual violence on campus, but the way in which the importance of party culture the importance of fun, the importance of selling the experience necessitates that silence to address and deal with the fact that one in five female college students will be sexually assaulted or raped runs against what is being sold. I also want us to think about the way in which pop culture f sows the seeds, feeds. Here are just a few ads where we see rape culture and its manifestations in popular culture. of rape culture is blaming women, citing clothes and alcohol, reflecting the ways that misogyny excuses males, particularly white heterosexual male violence, rationalizing and normalizing since men can't control themselves. The cultural focus on party culture, on what happens on Saturday night, on what happens away from school, lets colleges and universities off the hook. They are selling the fun the experience, the alcohol, the drugs, and the sexual fun. Universities are selling just as alcohol companies are selling, just as other advertisers are selling, an experience where sexual fun 
where sexual violence is central. This is rape culture, and one that universities profit off of in so many ways. The normalization of party culture, of rape jokes, of calling women sloots on yik yak, on the hypersexualization of women on and off campus, speaks to the ways that university culture is in imagined as apart from society at large. What is accepted as part of university culture, quote unquote, kids being kids, or what happens on the college campus stays on the college campus, speaks to race and gender privilege. As noted by Jackson Katz, the argument that, quote unquote, boys will be boys actually carries profoundly anti-male implication that we should expect bad behavior from boys and men. The assumption is that they are somehow not capable of acting appropriately or treating women and girls with respect, end quote. Just as parties feed on and provide oxygen for rape culture, so does pop culture. I mean, you can see the shared language, the Bud Light ad, the perfect beer for removing no from your vocabulary for the night. The language of the friend zone. And then lastly, I wanna go back, because I think one of the important challenges to connect these discussions can be seen by the erasure of sexual violence experienced by students uh, of color, of women of color on campuses, speaks to the ways that hypersexualization, exotification is normalized through party culture, and then even in those discussions about sexual violence on campus, we don't see the voices, the experiences of students of color, of women of color documented. And I think the challenge of connecting these two, of looking at the ways that even in these movements challenging who gets erased. So as I'm moving forward, I, what I'm trying to get us to think about is the rippling effects that what happens on Saturday night is very much connected to what happens when you're walking down campus. Those daily microaggressions. And those daily microaggressions, those daily affronts, those daily reminders of who belongs, of whose experience matters, of who is seen as the student, of who is welcomed, that that's very much connected to what Mark Anthony Neal describes as the macronuses. That we can't just think about things at an individual level, but we also have to think about it at the structural level. And we have to make those connections between hate crimes, between the everyday experiences, Studies that, that show that roughly 25% of students of color experience name calling, verbal aggression, harassing phone calls, and other forms of psychological intimidation each year. We need to make the connections between racist graffiti and the ubiquity of the N-word being used on campus. I mentioned F Faga, uh, Pika and Fagan. They had students keep uh, racial uh, journals, white students from several universities. And they found that some students reported hearing the N-word 70 times a day in the backstage.
the ability to create and sustain racially homogeneous spaces, to create spaces that privilege and empower heterosexuality, emboldens and engenders those microaggressions. Rippling effect has a rippling effect. That rippling effect can be felt and seen in the culture, but it also can be seen in the experiences. So that when we're talking about the experience, and we're recognizing the way that racism and sexism on Saturday night, racism and sexism and homophobia in the classroom, the way that slurs and microaggressions circulate, the way that it can be seen in curriculum, staffing, then we have to begin to ask, paying for what? Research has shown that campus climate, including the impact of microaggressions, shapes the experiences of students of color. According to Gray, Easton, and Ellison, African-American uh, students reported fewer positive social experiences with student peers and also performed slightly lower academically than white students suggesting that there are different facets of the transition to college, such as socialization, that may be more difficult. Rodriguez found that the GPA of African American students suffered because of campus climate. Others have found that it affects retention. So what does it mean that colleges and universities are basically admitting students and then creating a climate that is antithetical to learning, that is antithetical to not only the social experience, but an academic experience? As evident from research and daily headlines, the issues of racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, and transphobia isn't merely defined by those daily slights, racist and sexist jokes, and the N-word flying out of white people's mouths. It's not just an environment that sanctions transphobic slurs as quote unquote teachable moments, that dismisses blackface parties as kids being kids, but one of systemic hostility and violence. <coughs> Each points to a larger cultural reality of racism, sexism, homophobia, and violence. Quote, over the last few years, we have seen a rise in ghetto parties on college campuses around the country. The performance of these racist rituals in full public view indexes a sharp ideological shift on many college campuses, notes Mark Lamont Hill. As universities become increasingly corporatized and militarized spaces, attacks on tenure, free speech, ethnic studies, and women's studies, on faculty diversity, they're increasingly becoming features of the higher educational landscape. It is within this post-culture war context that these parties can be positioned within the public sphere with no substantive retribution. Again, it, if it is being sold as part of the experience, either the experience to learn, the experience to make a mistake, the experience of free speech, of fun, it is no wonder that we see this on campuses across the country and other related issues. All right, I know I'm running out of time, so let me talk about two last things. 
The rippling effect. The rippling effect leads to, but also necessitates, a university culture where students of color are seen and not heard. Anyone wanna, anyone know what, what's going on in these images? <laughs> Who wants to, so I can have a sip of water. Who wants to, what's going on in our two images? Yeah, I don't know if I have a, I don't want to point. Yeah, it's the one on the right. So this is uh, the admissions package from University of Wisconsin. In 2000, uh, Diablo Shabazz, a student at University of Wisconsin, was like walking around on campus, and he went into, I believe it was the admissions office, or, um, and one of the counselors excitingly ran up to him and said, Diallo, did you see the admissions booklet? He's like, huh? I'm sure he thought like, why would I, I'm here. Like, <laughs> what, what do you want from me? And he's like, um, no. So of course, you know, someone's like, did you see it? He went and looked. He's like, oh, wow, I'm on the cover. And then he probably realized after about two seconds, he'd never been to a football game. <laughs> and this is a, an example. Yes, they photoshopped him in. Because they're selling not only an experience, but they're selling the idea that colleges and universities are sources of social transformation, are progressive, are forward thinking, are diverse, are reflective. This is the moment where they say, oh, it's reflective of the nation. When we're talking about racism, sexism, violence, oh no. According to Tim uh, Pippert, a sociologist at Augsburg, Quote, diversity is something that's being marketed. They're trying to sell a climate. They're trying to sell a future. Campuses are trying to say, quote, if you come here, you'll have a good time and you'll fit in. Just don't worry about the parties and the N-word and the rape culture and the lack of faculty of color, and the lack of diversity in curriculum. You'll fit in. Look how, look. Not only will you fit in, but you will lead the nation to push aside its racial history. We don't actually need integration, we'll just Photoshop it. Pippert, along with several researchers, conducted a study of more than 10,000 pictures within America's colleges uh, brochures, juxtaposing those numbers with the actual diversity at these institutions. I, you, you know the results. <laughs> there was a disproportionate number of students of color in these brochures, faux diversity, brochure diversity. For colleges and universities, a picture is worth a thousand dollars and more. <laughs> the value of presenting itself as a modern change agent, progressive, and leading to a new America. Yet these pictures aren't based in reality, instead perpetuating both a false sense of diversity and a belief that the job of 
the college and university ends once diversity is achieved. So the logic of neoliberalism is that diversity can be seen and calculated. That the job of the university ends at admissions as opposed to when it, that's when it starts. If the goal is to be diverse, then students of color, GLBTQ students, will be seen, not heard. They'll be seen in brochures, they'll be seen in graphs. So long as it doesn't impact admissions and retention, campus climate is pushed aside. Racist and sexist parties will remain unfortunate, but not central issues. Microaggressions inside and outside the classroom are merely sad consequences of free speech. Stacy Patton makes this clear. The irony is, th is that many uh, PWIs, predominantly white institutions, appear to have the signs of progressive campus cultures and healthy race relations, especially in comparison to their 1950s predecessors. As Mary Beth Gasman has noted, most universities have all the ingredients needed to produce a post-racial promised land. Diversity office, glossy brochures, and admissions materials with a sprinkling of multicultural faces, cultural centers, administrative diversity positions, and diversity programs infused throughout new student and parent orientations and student affairs activities. The problem is that they are signs of an alleged commitment that is rarely realized. And they give the false and dangerous impression that race relations and gender relations are much better than they really are. It is no wonder that so many universities lack even the basic data on faculty diversity or a plan to address systemic racism. I'll just say, I asked my university in the last year for data on faculty diversity. I might as well have asked for the secret recipe. They look, they were like, oh. And sadly, at many colleges and universities, you can look at the diverse, you can count it. It is no wonder, 95% of African American faculty teach at historically black colleges. It is no wonder that so many universities lack even the basic data on faculty diversity or a plan to address systemic racism, much less define it. Historically, uh, white institutions are too busy cashing in on the commodity of their diverse bodies to actually invest in addressing the experiences of students and faculty of color. This is what Rinku Sen says is the difference between diversity and equity. She's, quote, she says, diversity is about variety getting bodies with different genders and colors into the room. Equity is about how those bodies get in the door and what they are able to do in their post. A touristic mentality mandates surface diversity. Equity is antithetical to that touristic experience. So, I'm gonna finish up. I promise. I wanted to finish, well actually I'll just play it and then I'll say one last thing. This year, only 35 are predicted. Hold on. This is uh, from a group at UCLA known as the Black Bruins and they did this video to be heard and seen. In fall 2012, the total enrollment, graduate and undergraduate, for African American males at UCLA was 660 students. 
that's 3.3% of the 19,838 other males enrolled here. Out of that 660 African-American male students, 65% are undergraduate athletes. The number of entering male freshman students was 2,418. Only 48 of them are African-American. The graduation rates for African-American males at UCLA is 74%, which means out of that 48 freshmen last year, only 35 are predicted to graduate. When we were children, we learned how to mix colors with a paintbrush. We learned that white mixed with anything makes it brighter, but we wouldn't dare mix anything with brown or black or else our entire creation would be ruined. What we failed to realize was that the untouched dark section of the paintbrush palette became the symbol of the melanin in our skin. The painter only used us to write words that were dark enough to be noticed on a white background. So if words are all we are good for, then don't you dare tell us to silence our voices when we choose to speak. Now you tell me that I should be proud to be at UCLA when only 35 of us are predicted to walk across that stage, when most of us are dropping out from the lack of financial aid while Judy Olian, Dean of Anderson School of Management, just spent $647,000 on first-class flights and hotel stays. But waiting for an apology is asking for the impossible because no snowflake in an avalanche ever feels responsible. But you tell me I should be proud to be a Bruin. When we have more national championships than we do black male freshmen, it's evident that our only purpose here is to improve your winning percentage. So not black high school kids can care less about grades, just as long as the number on the back of their jersey doesn't fade. And you tell me I should be proud to be a Bruin. But according to Professor Sander, 3.3% is far too many black kids. On his perfectly paved roads, there are far too many black skids. This school is not diverse just because you put it on a pamphlet. But you'll name a building after Albert Connoisseur who publicly opposes affirmative action? The action that can make our fraction on your demographic pie chart look more than just a second hand on a clock. It's all talk just to maintain this fraudulent reputation of this institutionalized racist corporation. They don't care about the cultural limitations of being a minority in society, so we have become our own painters with our own palettes, and we have voices that speak defiantly. So we ignite the flames to help us find the path to our future, increasing graduations, not incarcerations, transforming education because our numbers can't be any fewer. So don't be surprised that we have become rebellious for what has happened to us. When every black student class feels like Rosa Parks on the bus, we are trying to rewind time with role reversal as our revenge because we have no other choice when the university refuses to come to our defense. But we have come too far to let history repeat itself. Even when they are peeling off the dark fur of the Bruin pelt, because our faces are just used to cover up from the public what's really inside. Revitalizing lies to perpetuate your disguise. Stop pretending that the wounds of our past have healed. We're not asking for a handout. We're asking for a level playing field. Those with less opportunity are fighting for their position, trying to find their place. But those with privilege are hitting triples when they were already born on third base. So with all my brother's hopes and dreams that this university has tried to ruin, how the hell am I supposed to be proud to call myself a Bruin? Uh, I don't know how to follow that, so I should have just, that should have been the end. Because um, it, it brings everything together. When students of color are seen and when they're rendered invisible, silenced, what is being sold? Whether it's in that brochure or at that party. Again, quoting from Rinku Sen, 
After nearly 50 years of applying anti-discrimination laws, American workplaces are still dominated by white men. Men of color and all women have more access to some jobs than they used to, but the ranks of decision makers come nowhere close to reflecting our numbers in the nation as a whole. This is the root of tokenism. Tokenism means that you can come to the meeting, but no one will pay any attention to what you say. It means that the workplace will open the door to you as long as you look to the extent possible and act just like the white men who are already there. Don't question the party. Don't question the joke. Continuing. It means that you'll be invited to the party, but you won't be allowed to make any requests of the DJ or help set up the playlist. I've seen dozens of quote unquote diverse workplaces in which all the people of color are in the manual jobs and all the women are doing the clerical work. All work has dignity and value, but no one should be stuck in a position they've outgrown because employers segregate their workers by race and gender. Diversity is a start, even a good start, but it cannot be our end goal. The end goal has to be in shared power, responsibility, and reward. In short, equity. To get equity, we have to promote fair treatment both before and after hiring, end quote. Before and after admissions. In the classroom and in the campus commons. In the curriculum and within the faculty ranks. During the week and on the weekend. In public and in virtual spaces. Demands that lives of color matter should not just be for brochures, not just on diversity charts, not just in the appropriation of what John Ogbu would describe as how we operate, how we practice multiculturalism as the four Fs, food, fun, festivals, and fashion. That is not equity. And this is why protests will continue. From Concerned Student 1950 to I2M Harvard movement, from Yale to UCLA, from small liberal arts colleges to big universities, students are making clear that they will not be tokens, they will not be tools, they will not be tour guides. They will not be objects, the lessons. They will not be part of a culture that privileges white, cisgender, male, touristic experience. An open door will not suffice. And until universities create these pathways and spaces of equity, it's clear that today's students will use a range of tools in their march towards justice. And with each, the hypocrisy and empty rhetoric will be clear. With each social media campaign, with each effort to expose the daily harms and the systemic violence, they are once again reminding America of the power of Langston Hughes's words. They'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. Thank you. So now we'll take any questions anybody has. I'll run the mic to you. I have a question and a comment. The question is, what does the data currently suggest for women professors, women in academic versus diversity of people of color? What do you mean? What, what, what? What's the statistical data? 35 years ago when these symposiums were started, we saw a trend and it was white women getting into the teaching positions 
and the majority of, of them were white women, but then women versus a black male professor at, a, at teaching at a mm -hmm. law school. You get the question? Yeah. Um, the, the, the trajectory is pretty similar. Um, and I guess th I would say the, the, the importance is actually expanding that conversation and looking at it beyond that one data set in terms of um, just looking at the aggregate of faculty. We have to look at where, what departments, uh, what, you know, so if we look at the, the lack of both gender and racial diversity in STEM, and then look at across the campuses, those fields are what field administration. So that is leading to dis perpetuating a lack of diversity in terms of presidents, provosts, deans. Um, but we also then have to talk about, I'd say two other things, that even when we look at that data and say, oh, look, the ranks are changing. The next question is, is the culture and the climate changing? And then when we look at, I'll just give two examples. If we look at service demands, we see disproportionate amount of service, labor that is essential, yet devalued, not rewarded. It's kind of reflective of the way that labor is, the feminization of labor leads to devaluing. So we see that. We also see things like evaluations, as an example. So the emphasis that the discussion is only about diversity doesn't allow us to have a discussion about, hey, things like evaluations replicate those inequalities. And if those tools, and increasingly in our neoliberal logic, that becomes, you know, assessment. If we see data after data that says, hey, race and gender matter when students fill out evaluations, that it affects. I say this all the time in my class, that up until, now I have to change what I say, up until last semester, not a single student had ever commented on my clothes in an evaluation. Either good, either good or bad. Nobody had ever said like, he matches well. <laughs> or someone needs to get him some new clothes. Or um, it's not very professional for him to wear X, Y, and Z. I, I say that in class all the time as an example. And, of course, last semester, someone wrote it on my eval. I don't know if, see, now we have a, we have a, uh, a bias. I, I plant it, so I don't even know. But if I talk to my colleagues, my women colleagues, and particularly women of color colleagues, that is commonplace. And even, I want us to think, people will say, well, what if it's a positive? Like, I write, she's got great shoe game. <laughs> this professor is hard. This professor is rigorous. This professor is challenging. This professor has good shoe game. How is that gonna be read? when we're talking about promotion, talking about jobs. So I think that's the key, is looking at diversity and then when we talk about experiences, when we talk about everything from evaluations to daily microaggressions to sexual harassment. Um, so yeah, and you had a comment. The comment is, that will show how prehistoric I am. 40 years ago, we went through what you just described right now, the token 
and the expectation from them, but it shouldn't alarm me maybe, but it still does because it's personal. The, that brochure up there, that row, we used to laugh at those in law school 40 years ago because we knew what the game was, but that is the same exact game now. And do you have any opinion and or suggestion on how that dynamic changes? Um, because it's getting a little old and tired. It, it, well, I actually think one of the, the broader things that I think about a lot is as, as much as we can talk about social media and online technologies as being part of that culture, part of uh, a culture of violence, whether it be yik yak or the posting of, of images from parties, um, the comments, any number of things, those technologies also become the spaces to push back. So the fact that, well, I can talk about the University of Wisconsin, the fact that people are looking at those images is part of the way that transformation happens. The fact that students at Harvard and Michigan and across the country did the I2M Harvard or at University of Missouri, that's how that change happens. And I do think one of the other elements that maybe has shifted that makes it actually more difficult is colleges and universities are increasingly, as I mentioned, more, which is difficult, more corporate. Uh, and so the division between the person who makes that admissions brochure and faculty and students is as great as ever. And so that makes it even more challenging because not only are these spaces siloed and separate, but, but uh, accountable to different people. And if the people making those brochures or the people who are responding to the parties are more accountable to outside forces, whether it be legislators, donors, then to you, much less broader communities, it's that much more difficult. So I think breaking down those silos is essential. Other. So I wanted to follow up actually kind of on your question um, about the admissions brochure. So there's a conversation in college admissions about how we should represent our student populations. Um, should, we step, should we represent them exactly as they are or plus one in hopes of changing our student population over time so that we can change the college culture? And I'm just wondering where you would fall in that conversation. So I I think it's an important conversation because is it, I'll use a different language. It, it, does it reflect reality or does it, is it aspirational? Um, and I guess I have a hard time with the, the logic of aspirational if nothing is done. So let's go back to the, to the data. If we see that campus climate affects retention, GPA, success, and you're not addressing that, then you can put it on a picture that it's a diverse campus, but you're fostering a culture that undermines that diversity. So if it's aspirational, then it has to be aspirational beyond presentation. And it has to be beyond silencing those concerns because so often those concerns are pushed aside because again, if the goal is to be diverse and students are saying, hey, this is my experience, it 
To me, the response should be, all right, well, what are we doing that is not only antithetical to having a diverse place, but clearly antithetical to having an equitable place? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have a hard time. Um, what, what's the follow-up? What's the follow-up to the image? Um, or is the image enough? And I think we can see in terms of other policy decisions, other choices. Um, because this is, this, is, this is actually a conversation I've long had with colleagues that it very much connects, that do you, as an institution, or as not even an institution, do we, as those who are invested in social justice, push for diversity? Because in changing student populations, that that will disrupt this culture of, of violence, of racism. That's, that if colleges and universities more reflected the nation, then when parties like this happen, people will be called out and held accountable. And then there's the other side is, well wait, we're basically encouraging students to come into a climate that will be hostile. And I think it's incumbent upon us, particularly those of us with power and privilege, to change that culture so that students, so that their lives matter on campus, not as, you know, change agents. Um, but, I, but I think ultimately it's what's behind that picture. Because, um, there are certain things that, that, that clearly universities want to present. So like at Washington State University, I don't know if this is true. I've long been told that they will not take any pictures with snow. I don't really understand it. Like people, you know, have a weather app. They can see it snows. But you look, and the vast majority are pictures, fall and spring, it looks happy, and you know, everyone's sitting out in the sun. To me, Photoshopping or rep, you know, making it look like 15 to 20% of your student population is African American when it's only 4%. That's beyond, that's, yeah. But, but I do think it's, a, it's, a, it's important um, because of course, we also want our institutions to reflect and value that diversity and not accept. But if it only sees itself through that aspirational yet doesn't do anything to reach that aspiration, I mean, I can say I, I aspire to save money. But if I spend it every day, but I have a big picture with a piggy bank that's full, you know, that's my goal. I'm, I'm aspiring, I, I'm keeping focused, but I'm not doing any of the things that need to be done, both in terms of actually creating diversity and most importantly creating equitable, empowering spaces. But good question. Other? Oh, wow. It should be a quick question yep. about uh, wet versus dry campuses. Um, I'm wondering if like in your research you've seen in particular with rape culture and with racist party themes, that mm. campuses that are wet have less of those negative issues. Um, like I think dry campuses like ours force a lot of students or a lot of students choose to go off campus to celebrate um, or go to campuses that are wet 
and we mm. end up, well, dry campuses end up messing with wet campuses. Mm. So, okay. well, I haven't done, that's a, it's a good question. Um, and I'll just say your answer kind of points to the, the complexity um, that in some ways we could think like, oh, you know, campuses without Greek life uh, with the, that are dry are pushing back at this, this culture, yet in some ways they're just pushing it into someone else's neighborhood. And in doing so, are saying it's not our, it's, it's, it's not our problem, it's not our culture, it's, not, it's happening elsewhere. Um, so in some way, it's something I think about specifically to the way that we often talk about many of these issues, whether it be race themes parties, uh, sexual violence, and its relationship to uh, both Greek life and athletics, that there's a danger in isolating and making it unique and saying that, again, the rest of the campus is post, doesn't have anything to do with it. But I, yeah, I haven't done anything in terms of, um, when I look at, yeah, I, I'd have to look at each of the examples to see. Um, the one thing that I have noticed is that you do see race theme parties across different types of colleges and universities that we can see big, you know, football schools and then small uh, liberal arts schools. I mean, so it, it doesn't, it, it, it isn't often, or it doesn't fit the narrative that we often get that it is just, you know, the, the party school, the, the football school, and that I think reflects that those uh, might get more media coverage, um, but not when we look. And again, these are just the ones that are seen. Um, you know, when the, the, the commonality when students tell me like, oh, I went to a, a party and this happened. So it doesn't even have to be a race theme party when we can, where the realities, you know, for example, and I was talking to someone before about this, uh, I had a student come and tell me that a white male student was at parties, at, um, I think he said it was two straight weekends, and he noticed that whenever black students walked into the party, they changed the music. I changed the music from hip hop to country music. And so the ways in which that communicated you're, you're not wanted, you're not welcome, or to think back to the, the book by Pika and Fagan, they, say, they might say that that was a cue of saying, hey, our all-white party just became integrated. We just went from being backstage to front stage. Change how you're talking. Um, so that's the other thing is that, that we, can, we need to think about the various ways that this culture materializes. And some places it might materialize through Greek life. Others, it might materialize, you know, in the classroom and social media on other, yeah, so, good question. I'll have to look more at that one. This is the last question. Oh, <laughs> I'll stay here. I'm sorry, oh. it's sort of a little bit long. Um, so I was just thinking about like the theme of the symposium and how it's like game on and playing and um, you're addressing kind of college parties and students uh, culturally appropriating. And so I was hoping maybe you could speak a little to the desire that most like college students feel, but especially kind of I've noticed among some more like upper class or privilege and specifically male, this feeling of needing to escape and like kind of have an adventure and have a good time and have this fun time and like, 
I'm celebrating like Cinco de Mayo wearing ponchos and sombreros and like thinking that they kind of have a right to do it and that it's just funny and like you dress up a little and this is the right way to celebrate and trying to take some claim over these cultures that they ha they know nothing about. And so um, if you just maybe kind of address that and as it ties into like yeah, I mean, fun and the playing theme. Yeah, I think, I think you, 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 you tied it together really nicely. I mean, it, it becomes the appropriation the appropriation and the flattening of culture as, as object becomes part of that play. Um, and this goes, you know, we could do, talk about the long history of, of, of minstrelsy, um, that, that minstrelsy, the ability to cross-dress, to don blackface, was a statement of power, uh, of whiteness, of normalizing whiteness, as whiteness as not only the, the, the basis, the norm. I mean, you can even think to what uh, Cy Stokes in the video was saying in terms of mixing color, that whiteness becomes the point of departure. But whiteness as not only the point of departure, but as civilization, as respectable, as desirable. So when, you know, you see these parties and they're, MLK Day parties. It's not that people then come and dress up as Ella Baker, as Fannie Lou Hamer. They don't come and say, I'm going to come as John Brown. I'm going to come and But they, it's not even appropriating culture, it's appropriating a stereotype that normalizes a construction of the other that is comforting and pleasurable, because in doing so, it renders whiteness as desirable, as the basis, as foundational. And so, and I think increasingly, this is what I wanna talk more about, what is important to think about it in this moment is you have a culture that increasingly says white males are under attack. So then these become moments of saying, look what I can do. What are you gonna do about it? Because clearly there's a desire to put it out there. Otherwise, maybe we could make the argument after the first one, like, oh, they didn't think to put the images on every social media site. The fact that those images are putting, put out there is an assertion of power, like look, look what we can do. Look what we can say. And then the cover. It's just a joke, I didn't know. Who even gets to say I don't know? So that, that in itself becomes privilege and power and a source of pleasure. Like, so the ability to try on, to reduce people of color to objects of consumption. And in many ways, it, parties function in the same way that those brochures do. Diversity in absence of diverse bodies. The illusion of diversity. Diversity without accountability. Diversity in being seen, but not heard. And if we can render diversity through objects that you can buy at the 99 cent store, then accountability is contained. I guess we're out of time. But I can stay here if people have questions. Thank you.